Good morning. morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Abernathy Christian Church this morning. For our call to worship, I'd like to read from Psalms 46, verses 1 through 3. It says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake, at its swelling pride. We have some announcements that we'd like to cover this morning. Um, there'll be an elders meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 here at the church. Um, next Sunday, we'll have congregational meeting and carry-in dinner. Um, are there other announcements that we want to mention at this time? We still have several people that are on our prayer list. Um, Charlie went in for surgery last week and everything went well with him. He's as ornery as ever. Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, for some people you have a hard time getting him up and moving. I think Mary's problem is keeping him slowed down, probably the other way around. Um, we did get kind of a little bit of an update from Alex, um, and there, uh, we're looking at like everything up there at the Mayo, like the medicines that he's on and, and uh, the kidney function and all of that. And I, uh, last update that I had was earlier this week. So um, we'd ask to kind of continue to keep him in your prayers as he's undergoing analysis and kind of the way that they do things at Mayo is they do all kinds of tests. And then when they get done, they just bring you into a room and they sit down and they say, here's what we got. And here's what we think you need to do and so on and so forth. So um, kind of keep him in your prayers for that. Um, Betty uh, did get the reports back on her pain that she's been having. And I believe that she said, or uh, Marilyn said she had three bulge discs. And so at least they, they have something that they know that they're trying to treat and to, to work with. Um, are there any others that we want to, um, oh yeah, I got another one. Uh, Florence Denbo um, is back in the hospital. So that is, um, relative to Sherry, right? Cheryl. Shirley, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So um, Shirley's uh, still, her Florence, she is currently home, but still needs stuff. She's still got issues for sure. And her grandson is home. And th that is a blessing because he was in a head-on car accident. Um, and so we're grateful that he's doing as well as he is there also. Um, are there any others that we want to mention or update? Yes. So prayers for Kim as she goes in for surgery. Any others? Yes. Our neighbor's mom, Jean, has been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and she's already in hospice. She is Jean Shantz's niece. Juan is going in for a procedure tomorrow. So. All right. And um, we're glad that Colby's doing good. So um, he had a little ride. Mm -hmm. So we're glad that he's doing okay. Any others? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne this morning, we just are so grateful and thankful for all that you've done for us. We're grateful for the opportunity to be able to meet and to worship in your house. And as we come together, we lift up to you those that are on our prayer list who need your very real and very special touch in their life. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you just be with Betty and that they be able to uh, treat the bulge discs and uh, bring relief to her pain. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would just be with uh, Florence and uh, Shirley's grandson as they both need your touch and they need recovery there. I ask that you be with Alex, that Heavenly Father, they would uh, be able to come up with a plan that would be able to give him the relief and the healing that he needs uh, with his diabetes. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just be with Jean as she is um, struggling with pancreatic cancer. Lord, if, you, uh, if it be your will that you just reach down and touch her and bring healing to her body and Lord, if that's not your will, that when the time's right, that you would come and lovingly carry her home to be with you. 
Lord, I pray that you be with both Kim and Wanda as they prepare to go in for their procedures, that everything would go well, that there'd be no problems or difficulties, and that you just give them a quick and a speedy recovery. And Lord, we're just grateful for uh, the way that Charlie came through his hip surgery and that he's doing well. And Lord, we just pray that you just continue to be with him and help him to mend and heal also. Lord, we have so many that just need your very real and special touch, and we just ask that you just reach down and meet them at their need. And Heavenly Father, you send them the healing that they so desperately need and desire. We just pray that we would just give you the honor and the praise and the glory that you so very much deserve this morning. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 316. Let's stand. We'll sing first, second, and final verse of 316. Shelter in the time of storm, secure whatever ill be tight, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. By night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears of harm, no foes of fright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear. A shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever dear. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A weary land. A weary land, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. You may be seated. Our next hymn is hymn number 596, Count Your Blessings. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse of 596. upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed when you are discouraged sinking all is lost count your many blessings in them one by one and it will surprise you what the lord has done count your blessings name them one by one Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. 
Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Then if you'll turn over to hymn number 453, 453, we'll sing the first, second, and last verse of it as well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it Jesus, the great attitude indicator. There is a great toy they use in the Air Force to teach pilots the hazards of believing their senses. It is called the barony chair. The students sit in the chair with their eyes closed, thumbs pointing in the direction of motion as the instructor slowly begins to spin the chair. It is pretty easy at first, spinning to the right, both thumbs point to the right, but after about 30 seconds of spinning, at a constant rate, the body forgets it is spinning, and the thumbs point straight up. Then the most amusing part of the observers is when the instructor slightly decelerates the chair, and the students thumbs point vigorously in the opposite direction. Although their bodies are absolutely convinced they are spinning in the opposite direction, the students have dramatic proof to the contrary when they open their eyes and find they have been deceived. Life is a lot like the barony chair. We know the difference between right and wrong And if asked, we could clearly articulate the difference. But once 
put into motion with the effect of popular culture and media, we may be shocked to find ourselves pointing in the wrong direction. It is only by keeping our eyes focused on Jesus and his word that we can keep ourselves stable and upright. Only be accepting his sacrifice provided to us freely by God can we be saved. During pre-flight, in the old days, pilots used to reach down and cage the attitude indicator, which meant to align it to the horizon. The time of communion is our chance to cage our attitudes with Jesus. Jesus asked us to remember him by taking of this bread, which represents his body broken for us. The cup represents his blood shed to cover our sins. As we share in this memorial, let us resolve to keep our eyes on Jesus and not just during communion, but as the one true horizon every day of our lives. Let's be turning to the communion hymn on 175. Uh, singing all well three verses and standing on the last Our dear precious Heavenly Father, we thank thee, dear Lord, for once again bringing us around this table. This table, Lord, that you so wisely set for us, that we come here to remember. We come here to remember Jesus, remember his teachings, and to remember, Lord, that we can follow him, follow him forever. We just pray, Lord, now as we come here that you bless this meal, Lord. Bless this loaf, Lord. Bless this cup. For through them, we are reminded of how Jesus suffered there as he went to the cross and the blood that he shed, that precious blood that washes our sins away. We just pray, Lord, that as we come here, that we can open our hearts and our minds to you, Lord. Through thy Holy Spirit, you might speak unto each one of us and give us the strength and the willingness to continue to serve you and honor you in everything that we do. We ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.
heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Father God, as we come to this part of our service, we pause to reflect on the many blessings that you have bestowed on each and every one of us. Lord, you've been so very good to us, and you've blessed us in so many, many different ways. You've blessed us with food for our table, shelter for our heads, friends and family, and Heavenly Father, you've blessed us monetarily as well. As we reflect on those blessings, we give back a portion of that that you've so freely given and ask for your continued blessing on both the gift and the giver. I ask now that you be with the remainder of our service. I ask that you be with me as I bring the message that it be one that's easy to understand and easy to apply. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. This morning, if you would, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. I'd like to read from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. It says this, If we decide to go on sinning after we have learned the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins. There is nothing but fear in waiting for the judgment and the terrible fire that will destroy those, all those who live against God. Anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was found guilty from the proof given by two or three witnesses. He was put to death without mercy. So what do you think should be done to those who do not respect the Son of God, who look at the blood of the agreement that made them holy as no different from others' blood, who insult the Spirit of God's grace? Surely they should have a much worse punishment. We know that God said, I will punish those who do wrong. I will repay them. And he also said, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This morning, I've entitled my message, How to Escape God's Judgment. I was looking at going a different route, but in my heart, I really felt like this is what God was wanting me to share this morning. And there are two kinds of judgment that we're going to look at briefly this morning. There is the individual kind of judgment that happens when every one of us will have to give an accounting for the way that we live our life. Whether um, that happens, you know, at the Lord's coming or whether it happens when we draw our last breath, there is a point in time when every single one of us will stand before our maker and we'll give an accounting for the way that we've lived our life. Um, and Jesus talks about that in Matthew chapter 24. But there's also another kind of judgment, and that's the kind of judgment that God has brought on nations or people as a result of their sin. And so this morning, we're going to briefly look at each of those and how we can avoid the judgment of God. So there are three things that I think that we can do to help to avoid God's judgment. Now, I don't want this message to be... Um, I don't want you to look at this message as a hellfire and damnation kind of sermon that's, you know, where God's got to stick out and he's just ready to beat you over the head. Um, I want you to look at it from the opposite perspective of what the things that we can do that will help us, that will prevent us uh, from being on the, in a place where we would be judged, rather looking at it from a perspective of being where God wants us to be. So there are three things, and the first actually applies to individual judgment, and that is the first thing that we can do to help escape God's judgment is to, of course, become a Christian. In Romans 6.23 and then in Romans 3.23, you notice I put both those verses up on the slide this morning. It says this, when people sin, they earn what sin pays, death. But God gives us a free gift life forever in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, as human beings, every single one of us have sinned. And the result of that sin is that we are earning wages. 
The wages of that sin is death. If we continue to live our life the way that we are, without any kind of intervention, the end result of that is death. But God gives us an option. And that option is to accept the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And that gift brings eternal life. If you look at your bulletin on the back side, you'll see there that every Sunday you have the steps on how we become a Christian. It's been there for over 20 years. But this morning, I just want to look briefly at some of these steps. I'm not going to go in and look at all of the verses and scriptures that are there, but just kind of the steps on how a person comes to be covered by the blood of Jesus. And for most of you, this is just a review. This is something that you've already know and that you already did years and years and years ago. But the first thing that has to happen for a person to accept Jesus is they have to hear about him. Now, it seems astounding that in America, there could be people who have not heard about Jesus. There's churches on just about every street corner after all. But society today is very different than it was when I was growing up or perhaps when you were growing up. And there are, in fact, people who have never really heard about Jesus, even here in America today. For those of us who are living in the Midwest, it may seem equally as astounding and unbelievable, but there are some people that do not know in America today that eggs really come from chickens or that bacon comes from pigs. They just assume it comes from the grocery store (laughs) and have really no concept that of where it actually comes from. Now, it's important for us to hear about Jesus because to coin an old phrase, you can't know what you don't know. You can't know what you don't know. And so we have to hear about Jesus. Once you've heard about Jesus, you have to believe in him. And I think that there's two kinds of belief. There is the kind of belief that is mental assent, where we agree with something. But it doesn't necessarily change the way that we live our life, right? And then there's the kind of belief that changes our actions. The belief that we're talking about here is the second kind of belief. That kind of belief that not only has my mental assent, but changes the way that I live my life. I believe in gravity. And because I believe in gravity, when January rolls around here and we get an ice storm, it's going to affect the way that I walk. Because I believe that if I'm not careful, gravity will pull me to the ground and it'll hurt a lot. Right? We need that same kind of belief in Jesus, not just the mental assent that says, yes, I believe he existed. Yes, I believe he was a good teacher. But the kind of belief that says, not only do I believe in him, but I'm going to follow him and I'm going to do what he says. The third thing is we need to repent. Repentance is actually a military term that means about face. I'm going in this direction And I change the direction that I'm going, and I go in a different direction. So if I'm sinning, and I repent from my sin, I change my direction, and I don't do that sin anymore. If I'm not willing to change the direction, if I'm not willing to change my behavior, I've not really repented. If I stepped on Becca's foot, Becca's a nice person. And I said to her, Becca, I'm sorry I stepped on your foot. Will you forgive me? She's nice. She'd probably say yes. If I turned right around and I stepped on her foot again and I said to Becca, Becca, I'm sorry I stepped on your foot. Please forgive me. She's like to say, stop being so clumsy, Dad, and stop. But yes, I'll forgive you. About the fifth time that I step on her foot, Becca's going to say to me, no, you're not really sorry or you'd stop stepping on my foot, right? The same thing is true for us when it comes to our life. If we really truly repent, there should be a change in our behavior. We shouldn't live the same way that we lived before. Now, 
Does that mean that I'm never going to sin or that I'm never going to fail? No, it doesn't. But as I look at my life, what I should see in my life is a decreasing frequency of sin. In other words, I don't struggle with the same things today, hopefully, that I struggled with three years ago. I should see, as I look at my life, not that it's sinless perfect, but that there's a decreasing, decreasing frequency in the amount that I sin. Then we need to confess. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. It's not just enough to believe in my mind or in my heart that Jesus is God's son and that he's come to pay the price for my sins. I have to be willing to admit it to other people. I have to be willing to say, yes, I choose Jesus. You see... God doesn't want secret service Christians. He wants people who are willing to boldly proclaim that they belong to him. And so he calls for us to confess him. And then we have there to be baptized or to be immersed. Why would we do that? Well, all of the other things that we've talked about don't really require much of an act of obedience. I mean, yes, there is changing our life. That's an ongoing thing, and that doesn't happen overnight. But the act of baptism is an outward sign of something that's happening on the inside. We baptize here by immersion because it symbolizes a death, a burial, and a resurrection. Our old self is buried with Christ through baptism, and if we were to remain under that water, we would die. But we're raised up as a new creature in Jesus Christ. The old man is dead and the new person is raised to life. Some will say that baptism is a work. But for those of you that were baptized, did you do the work or did the person baptizing you do the work? You were just the person that was being acted upon. And it's kind of like this old illustration that I've used in the past. I know we don't write a lot of checks except for the offering plate anymore. But when you write a check, if I were to write each of you a check for a million dollars, and I don't have it, Gene can verify that. Um, but if I had a, enough to give every one of you, and I wrote every one of you a check for a million dollars, and I said, it's yours, you can have it, no strings attached, um, there's something you would have to do before you could spend a single penny of that money. You would have to flip that check over and you would have to endorse it. Now, if you signed your name on the back of that check, would you say, man, I earned that million bucks. <laughs> I signed my name. I earned it. No. Uh, but without endorsing the check, it's just a piece of paper. And when we are baptized... It's an outward expression of what's going on on the inside. And then the last thing that I have there is that it doesn't just end at the baptistry. You have to continue to live for Jesus each and every day of your life. It's not like, wow, I made it. All's good, you know, and then go live your life like the devil for the rest of, you know, the week. It doesn't work that way. You have to continue to live for Jesus. And that passage in Hebrews that we read kind of talks about that. It says, if we continue to sin willfully after receiving the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins, only the fear of judgment. In Romans 8, 1 through 8, it says this, So now, those who are in Christ Jesus are judged, what does it say there? Not guilty. Those who are in Christ Jesus are judged, not guilty. <coughs> Through Christ, Jesus, the law of the Spirit that brings life, made me free from the law that brings sin and death. The law was without power because the law was made weak by our sinful selves. But God did what the law could not do. And he sent his own son to earth with the same human life that others use for sin. 
by sending his son to be an offering to pay for sin, God used a human life to destroy sin. He did this so that we could be the kind of people the law correctly wants us to be. Now, we do not live following our sinful selves. We live following the Spirit, the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. Those who live following their sinful selves think only about things that their sinful selves want. But those who live following the Spirit are thinking about the things the Spirit wants them to do. If people's thinking is controlled by the sinful self, there is death. But if their thinking is controlled by God's Spirit, there is life and peace. When people's thinking is controlled by the sinful self, they are, act, they are against God because they refuse to obey God's law and really are not even able to obey God's law. Those people are ruled by their sinful selves and cannot please God. Did you notice what it said there at the very beginning? It said, so those who are in Christ Jesus are judged not guilty. When we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, our sins are forgiven and we are free of God's judgment. We're no longer judged guilty for those sins that we had committed in the past. The second way to avoid God's judgment is to seek God and to avoid sin. To seek God and to avoid sin. In Matthew 22, 36 through 40, it says this, reading from the New International Version. Teacher, what is the most important command in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Remember we said that there were hundreds of commands that the, old, that the Jewish people were required to keep in the Old Testament. But Jesus in the New Testament really boils it down to two. To love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And in one uh, passage even says... Uh, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your strength. You see, God wants us to have a relationship with him. And if we are focused on him, we're not going to be focused on the things that are going to get us into trouble. Those sinful things that will earn us God's judgment. <clears throat> and then... Um, and I, and I think it's important that we avoid, that we try to avoid sin as much as possible. Avoid sin and sinful people if you want to stay out of trouble. If um, you are in a car when somebody robs a bank, even though you may not have had the gun in your hand, even though you may not be the person who went into the bank building, and took the, the money out of the bank, you are an accessory to murder, or not murder, to, to bank robbery, right? Um, if you had been a part of the events that took place on January 6, 2020, if you had been there at the Capitol building, even if you did not go into the building, those people were considered accessories to the crimes that were committed there on January 6, 2020. And if you are anywhere near that facility, somebody has probably already come to visit you, right? The point here that I'm trying to make is that if we don't want to be judged, we need to stay away from things that are going to earn us God's judgment. Does that make sense? Um, in James... 4, 7, it says this, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know, there's an old saying, and there's probably a lot of truth in it. And that old saying is this, Nothing good happens after midnight. <clears throat> Have you ever heard it? Nothing good ever happens after midnight. And the whole idea of that is, 
that there's nothing worthwhile that you're going to be doing running around after midnight, only stuff that's going to get you into trouble, right? Because normal people at midnight are what? They're in bed, asleep. Exactly. And so the idea is to avoid even the appearance of evil. You know, it's not just, sometimes I think that we approach Christianity like a checklist. You know, accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, check. Went to church on Sunday, check. Read my Bible this week, check. Prayed for every one of my meals, check. All good, right? I don't have to worry about anything else. But see, Christianity is about a relationship. A relationship with the creator of the universe. And God wants us to pursue that relationship. The safety is not in what you know. The safety is in who you know. It's in our relationship with him. And I believe that if there's anything that in my heart that God has been asking me to share, to, to bring out to his people, is that God is, is in <coughs> wanting you to pursue your relationship with him. Because that's where the safety is. The safety is found in your relationship with him. Not in putting your faith and hope and trust in your possessions or, or politicians or government or programs. Your safety is found in your relationship with Jesus. And, you know, I don't think things are going to get better. I think things are going to get worse. And as things continue to get worse, it's going to be more and more and more and more important that your relationship is right. Because it's not just about your salvation, it's about your safety. And that brings me to my final point this morning. My final point deals not with individual judgment, but judgment of people and of nations, right? And that's this. Remember... God can judge the world while providing for his people. God can judge the world while providing for his people. There has been uh, good godly people have suffered all throughout history. That's nothing new. But most of the time, when good people suffer, it is at the hands of wicked men and women who are doing the bidding of their master, the devil. Does that make sense? Um, history tells us that Nero uh, started a tremendous persecution of the church. And there were early writers in history that said that the streets were lit at night by Christians who were burned at the stake. Those people suffered, but their suffering was not a result of God's judgment. It was a result of sinful men doing the bidding of their master, Satan. Right? What I'm talking about this morning is something different. I'm talking about God's judgment on mankind. And so if you turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2, I want to read verses 4 through 9. It says this. When angels sinned, God did not let them go free without punishment. He sent them to hell and put them in caves of darkness where they are being held for judgment. And God punished the world long ago when he brought a flood to the world that was full of people who were against him. But God saved Noah, who preached about being right with God, and seven other people with him. And God also destroyed the evil cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them until they were ashes. He made those cities an example of what will happen to those who are against God. But he saved Lot from those cities. Lot, a good man, was troubled because of the filthy lives of evil people. Lot was a good man, but because he lived with evil people every day, his good good heart was hurt by the evil things he saw and heard. So the Lord knows how to save those who serve him when troubles come. He will hold evil people and punish them while waiting for the day of judgment. And I really want to read that last verse one more time, and I want you to read it with me. 
So the Lord knows how to save those who serve him when trouble comes. The Lord knows how to save those who serve him when trouble comes. He will hold evil people and punish them while waiting for the judgment day. As I said before, godly people have suffered all throughout history, but the vast majority of the time it's been the result of evil men who are doing evil things following Satan. But when it has been God's judgment, God's righteous judgment on an evil people, God has judged those people while he provided for his own. And so very quickly, I'm going to give you three examples. We don't have time to read the scripture, but if you've noticed in your sermon notes this morning, there's lots of stuff in there and lots of scripture verses. So I'd encourage you, I left you with... uh, the Bible references to all of the things we're going to talk about. And I encourage you to go look those up and to check me and make sure that I'm right. Okay. So I'm going to give you three examples this morning. The first was the example of Noah. It's the same one that Peter used in second Peter. And in that case, God sent a flood to destroy the world because the world was evil. The Bible says that God looked upon the world and mankind and he was sorry that he ever created it. And he decided he was going to destroy it. But as he looked, he saw Noah and Noah won God's favor. Now, what I want you to understand and realize is that God in his judgment judged the world, but he provided for Lot righteous Lot and his family. But even in the midst of his protection, it required Noah's, not Lot, Noah, required Noah's complete obedience. Right? God told Noah, I want you to build a boat. I want you to build this mammoth ship. Uh, This boat was so large, it took Noah 100 years to build it. That's a long time, right? And the entire time, that entire hundred years, God used Noah to warn the people to try to get them to repent. But in the end, only eight lives were spared. Noah and his wife, Noah's three sons and their wives. That's it. God judged the world, but he provided for his people in the safety of an ark. They had to be completely obedient to him in order to obtain that protection. But when they were, God provided for those people. The second example that I want to give you is example of Lot at Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you look at the passage in Genesis chapter 19, these angels come and they appear and they come and they visit Abraham. And um, they tell Abraham that they're getting ready to go down and they're going to observe the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if they're evil, they're going to be destroyed. And Abraham begins to intercede or to plead for the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, if you find 50 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you destroy the entire two cities for those 50 righteous people? And they say, nope, not going to, won't do it. And he says, well, if it's only 45, if it's only 45 people, will you still destroy Sodom? No, if if there's 45 good people, we won't destroy it. Well, don't get angry, but if it it only happens to be 20 or 30, it, it goes from 50 to 45 to 30 to 20 and finally all the way down to 10. And God said, if there's 10 righteous people, I will not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. What does that tell you about the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? That not even 10 righteous people could be found in the entire two cities. The angel said to Lot, you need to flee because 
judgment is coming. But there are some instructions. The instructions were to flee and to not look back. Whatever you do, do not look back at the destruction, at the judgment that's taking place. And so Lot and his wife and his two daughters, they fled from Sodom and Gomorrah. But the Bible says that as they are fleeing, Lot's wife turned and looked back. And she died as a result of that. You see, God provided for his people in the midst of his judgment, but it required complete obedience. I hope you're getting, uh, uh, as we go through these, I hope that you're getting, you know, the the kind of the way things are working, because they work the same way in every single one. Let's look at the last one, the example of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. In Exodus chapter 12, verses 7 through 13, and then in verses 21 through 32. Um, Joseph is carried away into captivity down to Egypt. And through a series of events, Joseph becomes second in command in all of Egypt. Right? And so God uses Joseph to help prepare Egypt for a coming famine. They have seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And during the seven years of famine, Joseph's family comes to Egypt in search of food. And there's a whole another story there and probably several sermons. Um, but <clears throat> the long story short is that the Israelite people come to live in the land of Goshen in Egypt. And the Bible says that another Pharaoh came to power that didn't know Joseph, and he enslaves the Hebrew people, the Israelite people. And so for the next 400 years, they live as slaves in Egypt. God raises up Moses, and he says, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. If, you are not, if he will not let my people go, judgment is coming. And so... Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And uh, Pharaoh says, no way, not happening, not going to happen. And so they begin to have these plagues. And the first plague is that the Nile River is turned to blood. And then um, the second plague is frogs. Frogs everywhere. And by the time we get to the third plague, God tells Pharaoh through Moses, okay, from now on, the stuff that's happening to you is not going to happen to the Israelites so that you know that what's happening is not just an average plague, but that it's from me. And each of those 10 plagues dealt specifically with one of the gods or the deities that they worshiped. Because they had a God for the Nile. And they had all of these other gods. And it showed how our God, Yahweh God, is superior to the false gods that they worshipped. And they go through all of these different plagues. The hail and the boils and the, all of this bad stuff, right? And they come to the last plague. And Moses tells the Israelite people, okay, you need to prepare. You're going to sacrifice a lamb. You're going to make bread, but you're not going to allow it time to raise. It's going to be unleavened bread, the same kind that we use here, right? Uh, And there's a reason for that. And then you're going to take the blood from that sheep, and you're going to paint it onto the doorpost of your house. And when you do that, the next plague that's coming will be a plague of death. And when the death angel sees it, when he sees the blood on the door, he will pass over your house and you will not receive the judgment that God is sending. And so that night, when the death angel came, every household that did not have the blood on the door lost their firstborn male child. And not just children, but livestock as well. 
But God provided for his people in the midst of his judgment of the Egyptians. Again, it required complete obedience. Do you see where I'm going with this? Every one where God provided for his people, there was this element of complete obedience. If the Israelite didn't put his blood on the doorpost, their firstborn son died just like everybody else's. The message that I'm wanting to share with you this morning is that when we come to the book of Revelation, we see God's judgment on a world that's turned its back on him. We have the seven seals. We have the seven trumpet judgments. We have the seven bowls of God's wrath, right? All of those things being poured out on a world that's turned its back on God. But what God has shown us in his word, that even if we happen to be here, when that happens, that if we are obedient, if we do exactly what he says, he will look out for his people in the midst of his judgment against a sinful world. I don't want to focus on the judgment. I want to focus on the escape from God's judgment. And that is that God offers a plan for his people. But again, it requires for you to be completely and totally obedient. You can't just pursue life like nothing really matters and expect to be okay. Don't be in the car with the bank robber, right? <laughs> make wise choices. This morning, if you have a decision that you need to make, we invite and encourage you to come as we make, sing our invitation hymn. Our invitation hymn this morning is hymn number 363. And let's stand as we sing the first and final verse of hymn number 363. Father, as we come once more before your throne, we just love you so much, and we thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins. Help us, Lord, to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to you and to pursue that relationship so that even when trial comes, that we have safety that comes from you. All these things, Lord, we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hallelujah.